Well, welcome to the Houston Maritime Museum. My name is Emma Sundberg. I'm their Education and Public Programs Coordinator. And the lady who's just behind me there, that's uh, Lucia Cerritos, and she's our Business and Memberships Manager. And so I'm standing in for our director, Leslie Bolin, uh, this evening. Um, but I have a very nice duty uh, to do. Uh, so to welcome you here today, um, I've seen several of you before, but also a lot of new faces. So you might not be aware, but on your chair, uh, we do have another uh, lecture series coming up next month, both a history and an uh, industry lecture, just like this month. And actually, both industry lectures were brought to our attention by one of our docents, Tom Johnson, um, the DocWise uh, presentation tonight. And also, uh, next month, we'll have uh, Rick Fowler from LOG, and um, you'll see um, on the presentation flyers at your chairs. But in honor of opening up tonight, Tom has given me, uh, in lieu of his absence, um, a nice introduction uh, to give today to Mr. Erickson. So I'm just going to read Tom's words and then pass it on. So uh, I'm Tom Johnson right now. <laughs> I am pleased to introduce this evening's guest speaker, Mr. Rob Erickson, Vice President of Sales, Heavy Marine Transportation with the Offshore Energy Division at Los Gallus, an enterprise previously known as Dockwise. Mr. Erickson has logged some 23 years of experience with the technology he will be presenting tonight. His presentation will be another in the Houston Maritime Museum series of current marine technology topics, which we hope you will find both interesting and informative. The Heavy Marine Transport Operating Division of Royal Buscalis Westminster NV, a Netherlands company, is a unique and relatively new area of marine technology, primarily identified by a fleet of specialized vessels known as float on, float off, or flow flow, vessels developed to primarily serve the offshore energy industry in the last 20 or so years. These specialized flow flow vessels, seldom seen by most of us land lovers, are the 18 wheelers of the sea, but of much more impressive dimensions and capabilities. Now please uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Rob Erickson. <laughs> Thanks very much. That introduction was pretty good. I'm not sure I need to say much more, but uh, I'm really glad to be here. This is really great, and I'm kind of ashamed to say that I've never been here before, but looking around all of these great models, this is really a, a wonderful place, and, and I'm happy to uh, be here and present a little bit about our company, uh, DocWise, and I'll talk a little bit about DocWise and Boscalis and our relationship with that company. Uh, but before I start with anything, I, I can just tell from the people in this room that there's a lot of maritime experience in this, uh, in this room. So I want to make sure you understand, first of all, that I'm not a naval architect, and I'm not a seagoing guy. I'm a business guy, okay? So I was brought in to DocWise 23 years ago to help diversify what the company does. At that point in time, the company had a big reliance on uh, the jackup rig business. So when the rig business was good, it was good for us. When the rig business was bad, it was bad for us. So my job was basically to find a way to diversify the sort of cargo mix that these vessels can carry. And I think we've been pretty successful at that over the years. So we'll see some of that as we go on. So uh, when I started with the company in 1991, it was called Weissmuller, Dutch company, a uh, small fleet of about seven ships. Uh, we've grown to about 23 ships now. We've gone through various stages of ownership with various other companies. Uh, there was a company called Harima Offshore that owned us for a period of time. Uh, we went public uh, on the stock exchange in uh, Amsterdam for a period of time. We were owned by a private equity company for a period of time. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. Uh, but uh, then uh, we were bought two and a half years ago by a company called Boscalis. The first thing we always do is talk about safety. We're very, very, very big on safety. We have a program called NINA, which is no incidents, no accidents. In fact, uh, today, tomorrow, the next day, we're doing NINA training to our 80 employees in our Houston office at an off-site location, all-day training. So we really take it seriously. We want everybody to embrace safety as part of their everyday lives, whether they're on the vessels uh, or at home or in the office. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but just a quick uh, example of how serious we take safety. We have what's called a Vessel Safety Sponsorship Program. So all of our ships have one executive that is their sponsor. So I'm the sponsor of one of our vessels. 
So my job in that respect is to communicate with the captain and crews of that ship, wherever they are in the world, on a monthly basis. So I have kind of this pen pal relationship with the captain and crews. And I talk to them every month by email, whatever ocean they're in, and we try to talk about safety. And if you do this month after month, it gets really hard to figure out what to talk about relative to safety in an email. Because I can talk all day long about, you know, not wanting to trip over an extension cord in my office. But life on board ship is a whole different matter. And uh, talking to those guys about making sure that they think safety every day and everything they do is a real challenge. But we found that this program really does work. So, Voscalis is a uh, Royal Voscalis, meaning it's over a hundred year old company in the Netherlands, primarily a dredging company. So, they grew up as a dredging company uh, doing things like uh, the Hong Kong Airport Project, the uh, islands, the Palm Islands that you see pictures of in the Persian Gulf, uh, Singapore Harbor, lots of big projects around the world like that. Uh, a very profitable company, a conservative company, got a healthy balance sheet. Uh, very little debt, uh, and they, uh, about eight years ago, the dredging business sort of flattened out, and so they were looking for ways to grow. So what they did is they targeted the offshore energy business, and they bought a company called Smith. You may have heard of Smith Salvage, Smith Tug, Smith Harbor Towage. Uh, so in 2008, they bought Smith, and then three and a half years ago, they bought Dockwise, and their latest potential acquisition is Fugro, which is a seismic company, another Dutch company. The only companies they will buy are Dutch companies because our CEO is as Dutch as you can get. And uh, he holds his uh, senior meetings in Dutch, and he says, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. <laughs> so, there you go. So I have no chance of going any higher than that. <laughs> So anyway, these are just some pictures of some of the things they do, but let's move on with that. Uh, 11,000 employees, 1,000 vessels, that's kind of a stretch. That's including every little small boat on another boat you can think of, but it's a, it's a lot of equipment. Very asset-heavy company. About $4 billion in uh, annual revenue. So offices all around the world. Um, there's not that many offices in the United States because of the Jones Act. Uh, the dredging does not happen in the United States, so our CEO draws a big red circle around the U.S. and says, free trade, right. Um, and uh, we can't dredge here, so you know whether you agree with that or not, that's the way it is, uh, but we're here. Three primary pillars of the company, dredging and in, in, in infra, which is indeed the dredging part of the company. There's towage and salvage, which is the Smith Tugs and uh, Smith Salvage. And then the group that I work with, which is offshore energy, which is heavy marine transport, offshore installation, in-place repair and maintenance, decommissioning, uh, and subsea uh, projects. We have uh, ROVs as well. So this is just an example of the fleet of vessels that we have. The, the, the vessels that I deal with are the 23 heavy lift ships right here. With multi-purpose ships, uh, fall pipe uh, layers, uh, cable layers, uh, dive support vessels, uh, conventional barges and submersible barges, shear leg cranes, uh, and anchor handling tugs. These are the Fairmount vessels, of which we have five. Uh, Fairmount was bought also by Buscalis about two years ago. We've integrated those into our fleet, which was <clears throat> not well liked by myself because I've spent most of my career with the company convincing people not to use tugboats, but to use our heavy lift ships. So now I say, yeah, okay, if you want to use a tug, we can, we can help you with that as well. But those are 200 ton baller pole tugs, ocean going tugs. They're really not anchor handlers, they're pure ocean going tugs. Um, this is one of the dredger, dredgers here and here. And this is an example of some of the work that uh, Smith Salvage does. So let's talk about the energy side, which is what I'm a part of. Uh, this picture is very interesting, uh, I think, because 
it really shows what's going on in the Gulf of Mexico over the last five to ten years. This picture was taken two years ago uh, at the Keywood Offshore uh, Fabrication Yard in Ingleside, Texas. At that time, there were four structures there that are operating in the Gulf of Mexico. This is the Shell Olympus Tension Lake Platform. This is the uh, Anadarko Lucius Spar sitting on our Mighty Servant 1. That's the Bigfoot uh, TLP, and that's the Chuck St. Malo uh, semi-submersible production platform. So these are all production platforms in use in the Gulf of Mexico, with the exception of Bigfoot, which has had some problems getting hooked up. It's a few years behind schedule, and will probably be another year before it uh, is producing any uh, hydrocarbons. <coughs> but all of that equipment was brought to the Gulf of Mexico on our ships from the Far East. So a little more uh, close-up pictures of those same structures. Uh, Jackson Malo will show more pictures of that one later, but that's the largest cargo of any kind ever carried on the ship, at a little over 60,000 metric tons. Uh, Chevron Bigfoot was about 48,000 tons, and you can see a tremendous overhang right there over the side shell of the vessel. Uh, this is Mars B, or Olympus by another name, or uh, Michelle, and, and the uh, Anadarko Lucia Spar. There's about 20-something spars operating in the Gulf of Mexico, and we brought all of them to the U.S. Gulf except for one, uh, which a competitor brought when we didn't have a ship available. Uh, and if anybody wants to stop me and ask a question, at any time, just shoot a hand up, and we can we can do that. Except for Greg, he knows all this stuff. Yeah. I checked the tomatoes at the door. <laughs> did you do what? I checked the tomatoes at the door. Okay, good. I'm glad you did that. So more pictures. And again, in, in this business, pictures really tell a thousand words. So I brought a lot of photos to show you. And uh, this is the BP Thunder Horse project, which took us years to to develop. Uh, with BP and Exxon Mobil. Uh, at that time, it was about 59,000 tons, the biggest cargo that had ever been carried. And it was carried on the Blue Marlin. Before this cargo was carried, the Blue Marlin was 10 meters less beam and 10 meters less length. And so we lengthened and widened the vessel and added additional propulsion to the azimuth retractable azimuth thrusters underneath the superstructure specifically for that one cargo. So we spent $35 million just beefing up the ship to carry that one cargo. But of course at that time BP promised us they were going to make three of them. But they only did one. But it turned out to be a good investment anyway. So uh, that's been a very, very successful vessel. Uh, this is a typical fourth generation semi-submersible rig that uh, belonged to uh, a company called Shaheen in uh, Brazil that we shipped from the Far East to Brazil. And you'll see a pattern here that most of these cargoes come from the Far East to the West. Very few of them are fabricated in the West. That's sort of a one-way flow of this kind of cargo. So we're always looking for backhaul cargoes to get our ships back to the Far East, which is uh, a challenge. This is a round uh, drilling, semi-submersible drilling structure called the Settle in Brazil. Uh, it's kind of unique uh, in that it's, it's just a different type of structure. They've become relatively popular over the last five or six years. And uh, we've moved three like this and a fourth one that is a production platform. And I'll show you a picture of that in, in a minute. I have a question. Since you're the folks moving the, the platforms and all, do you have to deal with the flagging issues at all? Being what? that they're built over the flagging issue? No. Um, so the companies take care of that? They like take care of that. The flagging of the platform? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't get involved in that at all. We basically show up with the vessel. I mean, there's a lot of engineering that goes into this, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but the flagging of it, no. Not at all. That's their responsibility. So this is another uh, fifth generation semi submersible rig. We've moved many of these for Diamond Offshore. <coughs> Uh, and this one shows the new marlin partially submerged while loading. And so I guess this is maybe a good time to talk about how these ships work a little bit. 
These are semi-submersible heavy lift ships, so they're designed to partially submerge below the water. So the deck of the ship submerges below the water to a certain depth, which allows water over the deck so that we can float the cargo over the deck of the ship and then de-ballast the vessel to lift the cargo up out of the water. Uh, these, let's see if we can see, uh, these aren't good pictures to see the buoyancy casing. Maybe in that picture there over the aft end, you see a, a structure, a column sticking up in the back there, and there are two of those on the aft end of those vessels. Those buoyancy casings are there to allow the ship to submerge on an even keel when it comes down so that it doesn't tilt one way or the other too much. Um, so these are our brig. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, what's the draft of these uh, rigs? Of the rigs? As, as they're being floated across. Mm -hmm. how, how far down does the. Four does to the deck six meters. Four to six meters. So yeah. the deck is. More Seven to eight meters. Yeah, we could typically get nine to ten meters water over the deck. <clears throat> yeah, and then we have cribbing or wood that goes between the bottom of the cargo and our deck, so that the uh, the cargo bites into that wood. Mm -hmm. the friction coefficient that allows that cargo to sit down there and bite into the wood and not move around. around. Yeah, and then we have sea fastenings that we add to that. This this is a. Uh, Real typical picture. Um, our bread and butter cargoes are jack up rigs like these. So, this particular photo is a nice one because it shows two rigs with two ships, one in the background. This is uh, one of the Rowan uh, Gorilla uh, rigs here, and uh, <coughs> one of Rowan's rigs back here. But sometimes these legs will get to be 450, 500 feet high. So, if you think about a 45, 50 story building sitting on our deck. It's pretty impressive to see, I can tell you. And uh, a lot of engineering is done to route these ships in a proper way so that we avoid roll, pitch, and heave that might damage the cargo. So a lot of engineering is done to see, for instance, what is the leg bending moment of these legs? At what point do those legs tend to snap from the roll of the vessel? And the captain has what's called a critical motion curve that he follows, which says this is the maximum roll, the maximum pitch that you can uh, withstand with this particular cargo. And he'll do whatever he has to do routing-wise to avoid those conditions uh, to the extent of potentially even turning around and going back the other way uh, or seeking shelter. Well, can you give us an idea of a sea state in which you could not operate? Hmm, that's a good one. Greg, C State five, four, five, we get that five would do it. Five would do it. Yeah, it depends on the cargo. It, it totally depends on the cargo. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> you know, quite often we these, these cargoes coming from the east to the west, we come around the Cape of Good Hope. And that's a notoriously bad place to be. And sometimes we have to look for a weather window and we will seek shelter on yeah. one side or the other and wait for a you know, four, five, six day weather window before we proceed come around. So it's always, you know, safety first. We never guarantee a delivery date for a cargo, ever, because we say it's up to the captain. It's his sole responsibility to see that that cargo gets there in one piece. So the routing really becomes his responsibility. Are stabilizers used at all in the ships or are they too big? Too big. Yeah. We've thought about it. Yeah. Okay. No. Your ballast seawater? Seawater. And that's an interesting question. We, we fill those holes full of ballast water, and there's some parts of the world where we have to be very, very careful about where we exchange that ballast water, right? Mm -hmm. Australia, New Zealand, for instance, we have to make sure we do it far out at sea uh, so that we don't introduce any organisms that they don't want. So. Well, I was just thinking that those tall, if they're that high, that uh, it would have a tendency to rock the ship over the because of the moment arm of that, that much weight. Anymore. That's what I think when I look at it too. But, but the naval architects tell me that it's safe. And that the center of gravity is really down here somewhere. So it's, you know, because there's so much weight here in the hull of that rig and so much weight down in the ballast of, of the vessel itself, it's, the BCG is really much lower than it sort of looks like there. Yeah. How long does it take for the water to ballast? In and out, on and off. Four, five, six hours. Hours. Something like that. Yeah. Greg? I'm just going to add, actually, 
the heavier the cargo, it, it, you get a slower roll. Right. So you can withstand heavy sequence. It's just not a, It's the speed of the roll that's more deteriorates to the cargo than the actual angle. Exactly. So you actually do want to raise. It's like an aircraft carrier. You want to raise that deck and up high. You want to raise the center of gravity so you get to a point where you get a slower roll. Right. In fact, the answer to that sometimes, if we have a, a rig that's fairly light coming around the cape, we can't do it unless we put a second rig on the deck. And if we get two rigs, the total weight mass gets to where the, the, the behavior of the vessel settles down to where we can, can do it. So. Uh, are all uh, around the world trips made uh, through the Indian Ocean or can uh, do the weather conditions permit you to go uh, south of South America? 98% uh, of the time we do Indian Ocean, Cape of Good Hope. South America's just... Weather's you know, too unpredictable. It's not predictable, or... too difficult. Uh, I'm sorry? Oh yeah, anyway, it's 99% of the time it's the other way. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're working right now, uh, in fact today I've worked a, a lot on moving the, uh, the Polar Pioneer. You may have heard that Shell has pulled their rigs out of the Chukchi Sea in the Arctic with an unsuccessful well there. So that rig that drilled that well, we took it from Norway all the way to Singapore and then to Seattle, and now we're taking it all from Seattle all the way back to Norway. So that rig will have moved about 29,000 miles to drill one hole. <laughs> which is really a shame for Shell, I can tell you. Um, yes. You said these are made in the Far East. What country? Uh, typically, the, the production platforms are built in South Korea or China these days. Uh, for a long time it's been South Korea. Uh, China's starting to bite into that uh, quite rapidly for all the obvious reasons. Uh, but, uh, and these rigs are typically built in either South Korea or a lot of them are built in Singapore. What, what determines the rate that you're going to charge a company to move something? Oh, that's a secret answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's it's market conditions, you know. It really is. Our rates are just going down very fast right now because market conditions are not good. So it totally depends uh, if the if the rates that the rig company gets from the oil company go up, our rates go up. You know, it's just kind of that simple in a way. Uh, so we get what we can. Yeah. There's no magic formula to it. That I can tell you. Uh, so this is the uh, our newest ship, the Dockwise Vanguard, uh, with a uh, semi-submersible rig on board, uh, the Ocean Quest. This is in uh, Rio de Janeiro. We'll talk a lot more about the Vanguard later on in this presentation. But this is the newest iteration of the heavy lift ship. Essentially what we did is we said, all right, we want to build a new ship because the oil companies say we need one that's bigger. And we said, will you, will you help us pay for it? No, but we'd sure like you to build one. So what we did is we sat down with the engineers and the operation people, and we said, all right, start with a queen shape slate, and what would we love to have on a heavy lift ship that we don't already have? And this was the result, because they said, well, geez, how about if we didn't have a bow? And we have cargo that could overhang the bow and the stern, and how about if the, the crew quarters was on the side so that they didn't get the way? And how about if these buoyancy casings were movable and you could put them anywhere you want around the deck of the ship to optimize where you load the cargo from. So that was the result of the ship. Um, and we'll show you more pictures about that one. No, it was built in Korea. Yeah, designed in the Netherlands. What was the approximate cost of the shipbuilding? About two, about 300 million for that ship. It, we could have saved $40 million had we built it in China. And we were tempted to do that. But our first cargo owner, a Chevron, said, if you do that, we won't use it. So I said, okay, we'll go. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry? Why did they have that objection? I'm sorry? Why did they have that objection? Uh, uh, On-time delivery of the ship was really critical to them for that cargo. Uh, and uh, quality control. So for those two reasons, they objected. 
how often do they have on-site inspectors during the production? Um, usually once or twice. Uh, they'll, if they know they're going to use the vessel, they'll have inspectors come to the fabrication yard and check on the quality of the, of the construction. Yeah. What's the lead time to build one? Uh, two years. And how about the, is it a fair question, what's the average cost in the industry to rent one of these things? Daily basis? Um, <laughs> Half wow. million, million? I, I don't no, no, no. Uh, but, uh, right now, in today's uh, market, if you want to move a jacket brick from, let's say, here to West Africa, relatively short voyage, uh, five, six thousand miles, it would be, you know, four and a half to five million dollars. So we, we price it on a lump sum basis, not a day rate. All right. <coughs> so there's the, the, the Lucius Spar. I guess everybody may, if, may be familiar with what a Spar does. The spar is a cylindrical production platform that we is skidded onto the ship uh, via the stern, so it's literally pushed on on skid rails uh, onto the vessel, and then we bring it to the Gulf of Mexico. Then we submerge and float it off. Uh, they will do some things to the spar, uh, like these strakes that you see here that go around it. Those are to break up the, the ocean currents, you know, the harmonic distortion that would make it wobble in the water. They'll finish off those strakes and then tow it with tugs to the uh, production location in the Gulf of Mexico. And then they'll fill this, what they call a soft tank right here. They'll fill that with water and then fill this one with water and then that one with water and gradually upend it so that it's sitting upright vertical in the water with this end sticking up out of the water, about like so. And then the production top sides is built onto the top of it in place uh, at that location with offshore crane barges. And then it's moored to the seabed, and, and that's where it does its production. So here's another picture of the, of the Vanguard taking a partial production unit from uh, Keppel Fells in Singapore. Uh, to mm -hmm. Keppel Fells Yard in uh, Angra dos Reis, uh, Brazil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and here you see, you know, the deck starting to flood with water, right? So it's just underwater here. And this part right here is a bulwark that is around the bow that is removable. So if, if we do have a cargo that overhangs the bow, we can take that off. But under normal sailing conditions, we leave that on to help, you know, stop water from green water from coming on, onto the deck. But here you see a good picture of the bridge of the ship. So this is where the captain is, and there's an elevator right down here that goes to the 16th floor to get to the bridge. And one of the issues that we've had with this setup is because it's not in the center, the roll motions over there are sort of amplified versus what they would be if you're pivoting around that. So we've had a little issue with seasickness on this ship. It, for the most part, it sails pretty, pretty smooth. Yeah. The distinguishing line between the uh, orange and the white, is that the submersion line? Yes, exactly. Per good, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, this is typically where we submerge to. And these are meter lines uh, that go from the keel up to here. That right there is a four, I think it tops out at 42. So we can get 16 meters of water over the deck of this ship. So we needed to get you know more water for cargoes with deeper draft. And we'll talk about the deepest draft cargo uh, here in a minute. Uh, some of the other things that we do with the ships, uh, this is a jacket launch. So a jacket is a steel structure that stands on the seabed with a production platform that sits on top of it. How do you get the jacket from the land out to the sea and get it in place? One way to do it is to launch it off a ship. So we'll skid it onto the stern of our ship, go offshore and ballast the stern of the ship down a little bit and there'll be some rocker beams there and that jacket will literally stand up and just slide off the back of the vessel. So this jacket was uh, 22,000 metric tons, 
and it makes a hell of a noise when it slides off. I've <laughs> been out there, and it's really impressive. Uh, were you guys involved in the placement of Harmony and Heritage offshore of Santa Barbara? No. Our former parent company, Harriman, was. They built the Harriman 851 specifically for those two projects. And that's the biggest offshore barge in the world. Yeah. Uh, we do uh, float over projects with these ships. Now this is where we use the ships kind of like a giant uh, forklift in a way. So here's a top size, uh, 26,000 ton top size, skidded onto our ship. So we've taken those buoyancy casings and removed them, skid this onto a high grillage, and then the ship goes out to sea where there is a jacket structure standing on the seabed. And right here you see the legs of that jacket just sticking up out of the water. And typically there'll be uh, four to six pins sticking up on each side of the jacket. And what happens is our ship backs up in between those legs and then ballasts down and mates these cones right here with those stabbing pins and, and just set it down and then come out from under it and then it's installed. The entire deck is installed. So it, it, it replaces a lot of offshore interfacing that is time consuming and dangerous and what have you. So this is sort of the, the new plug and play way to do this. Uh, and we've done a lot of it. So pretty effective. Uh, and we have a, a, a company that we bought that makes little shock absorbers, not so little, but they go inside those cones. So that at the point in time when you release that 26,000 tons totally onto that jacket, you know, if anything moves the wrong way and breaks, it's just a disaster like you can't imagine. So these shock absorbers sort of ease that transition um, in place so that you don't have any uh, problems. So, Rob, would you back that up just a minute? Uh, yeah. If you're going to go to sea with a load like that, a cargo that's obviously asymmetric, do you calculate the center of gravity or determine empirically, or and do, can you move balanced water around to maintain trim of the vessel? Yes, to all of that. It's, it's calculated very, very carefully. And the ballast water, the ballast system is calculated very carefully. <coughs> Typically, these voyages don't go very far. Yeah. So this may go from South Korea to somewhere in the Far East, or maybe the Middle East to somewhere in the Far East. But they, this, this, this is a long voyage for something like this. So uh, this is another example of a float, what we call a float over. <clears throat> so this is a 19,000 ton top size of a drilling rig, a semi-submersible rig. This was the first time that a floating body was installed on top of another floating body. So instead of a stationary jacket, this is a semi-submersible rig hull that's floating in the water. And we back the ship in between those columns and lower that top sides down onto that hull. And so it's pretty tricky because you've got a, a hull that's floating and moving and in different ways, and, and a ship that's doing the same thing, you have to gently do that mating, but it's been pretty effective. We did it twice uh, for uh, gas pump, the Russian uh, oil company. This was for uh, two rigs that were used on Sakhalin Island uh, for drilling. How was your uh, underway performance with that kind of drag? <laughs> oh, it goes real slow. <laughs> real slow. It was semi submersible. Yeah. The, the towed vessel, the, the rig itself, uh, it has its own propulsion in this, does it not? Uh, some do, some don't. Um, these particular ones had uh, some thrusters, uh, but typically when it moves from one field location to another, it has a lot of tug assists. How many knots? Hmm? How many knots? How many what? How many knots? What's the boat speed? The what? What's the, the ship's speed when they're traveling? Oh, the speed. Oh, yeah. oh. Oh, our ship, when, when they're uh, typically traveling, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the open ocean, they're doing anywhere from 10 and a half to 13 knots or so. 
Are all, are all of these ships diesel driven? Diesel electric? Uh -huh. Typically. Yeah. Is the engineering space at the bow or the stern? The bow. So you've got real long uh, propeller shafts. Uh, your electric generators <coughs> aft oh. with shorter shafts from there. Yeah, general generator yeah. units on the forward end and a big two big motors aft. Yeah, the only thing runs aft is electric cables. Right. <coughs> right. And it, or or the the kind that swivel. Cordon. Some of the, the uh, blue marlin has. Thrusters, but most of these are more conventional. Yeah, con conventional <laughs> controllable pitch props. Yeah. This yes, one. Roughly, how many personnel are on a group like that? Twenty-two to thirty, hmm. roughly its crew size. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, this is another picture of the float over that we did of, uh, of Thailand. So here, here's a good picture where you see those those cones coming in contact with the stabbing pins of those four legs and then four on the other side. Uh, on to some other kinds of transports. Uh, we move all kinds of equipment. Uh, this was a pipe blade vessel uh, that we loaded. This particular ship is the only ship on our fleet that we don't own. And it's called the High Side 278. It's owned by uh, CNOOC, which is Chinese, uh, China National Offshore Oil Company. And they built this ship and they basically didn't know how to operate it or market it or do anything with it. Uh, and we said, well, look, we'll, we'll market it for you and have it join our fleet. So it's a joint venture that we have with them. Uh, you get some flyers in the mail at home, I'm guessing like I do. About once a week I get a flyer in the mail from Viking River Cruises. Yeah. You know, maybe some of you have been on one of those in Europe. So there's those long flat boats that they outfit like little hotels and that's 24 of them stacked up on the blue marlin that we brought from the Far East to Rotterdam. Yeah. Obviously, before they've been finished, right? In, in, in Holland, then they were outfitted with the top sides and everything, but these are the hulls. <laughs> That's kind of That's uh, container cranes, port cranes that are used to unload containers from container ships. Uh, we used to dominate the business of transporting these around the world, but that business has basically been taken over by a Chinese company called ZPMC. We still occasionally do some, like this one uh, in 2013. We took these from um, South Korea to Mexico. This is Manzanillo, Mexico. Uh, again, a very awkward looking cargo. It looks like the center of gravity is way up there, yeah. but it's really down here somewhere. These bogies, these wheels down here are really heavy. And so the center of gravity is really somewhere in here. And I'm always amazed that we can do that, but it, it's done all the time. Did you do the Houston cranes? No, those are typically done by our Chinese competitor. Okay. Yep. <coughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. How do they get them off? Hmm? How do they get them off? Uh, roll them off. <laughs> yeah, you turn turn those uh, wheels and roll them off. There's a way to skid them off, but typically you roll them off. Yeah. Um, ferry boats. Uh, this is a, uh, a boat that was used in Vancouver. Uh, it was a, a passenger uh, and car ferry that uh, the city of Vancouver sold to some Saudi Arabian princes. And we loaded two of these to convert them into yachts. Exactly. So we took those to Saudi Arabia to make them into yachts. Uh, some people have more money than. Uh, dredging equipment, uh, we move dredging equipment for all the world's dredging companies, not just ours. And this is some dredging equipment on one of our Swan class ships going around Cape Town. Uh, you can note here that this type of ship is a converted tanker. So it used to have a structure that came across here, it gets cut out, ballast tanks installed and a ballast system is installed. And so when you load cargo on this ship, or this type of ship, you can only load from the side. So those aren't purpose-built heavy lift ships, they're converted to heavy lift ships. Uh, this is another 
heavy lift ship conversion called our T-class ship, which are a little bigger. So you can see, again, it's cut out in the middle. And here are, what, one, two, three lift boats. Lift boats are sort of small, uh, work over uh, shallow water uh, rigs. This is a floating dry dock, so we talk about, again, expanding the kinds of cargoes that we carry. It really runs a, a wide gamut. This was a brand new dry dock that was built in Japan for a bigger uh, company, uh, fabrication company in Portland, uh, Oregon. Uh, so here's a case where we took that buoyancy casing that's normally here and just <coughs> rolled it up to the uh, fore part of the deck to make room to put that dock on at, a, uh, at an angle like that. So, and we moved lots of dry docks. Is that 16 stories high and the dry dock's taller than 16 stories high? Where's his line of sight? Well, this particular ship isn't as high as the, the one I showed you before, so this structure here is probably, you know, 10 stories high. Not 16, but it's still it's pretty high. But it looks like it's taller than the bridge. Yeah. Uh, it is. It is in some places, yeah. yeah. So do boats get dry docked at sea? Uh-huh. Yeah, so this is a dock that they use. What they do here is they cut the end sections of these docks. Well, in this case, they, they didn't cut them. They just didn't attach them. And they put the end sections inside the dock. So when the dock got to Portland, they reattached these end sections so the dock is actually much longer uh, than it appears here. And then they, yeah, they load various types of craft in there that they work on. We moved, just a quick story, we, we moved a dry dock for the city of San Francisco. Uh, a year ago. It sat there since 1942. The Navy used it a lot. The city of San Francisco wanted to get rid of it. They couldn't figure out a way to environmentally correctly get rid of the dock. So a friend of mine in the Navy, guy Greg, and I said, okay, you need to go talk to this guy. So I went to San Francisco. I said, I'll buy the dock from you for a dollar. And I'll load it on one of my ships in San Francisco Bay, and we'll sail off over the sunset, and you'll never see your dock again. Get it out of your way. Where'd you go? China to be scrapped. So I got the scrap value, of steel, and they paid me for the voyage, but it was, uh, it took two years to negotiate a contract to see if San Francisco. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend working in California. So. They wanted $1.50. Yeah. <laughs> so we do a lot of military, not a lot, but we do some military cargoes. This is the uh, SGX Sea Base X Band radar platform. Greg's very familiar with this. Um, this was a radar uh, system that was installed on a semi submersible drilling rig hole that was built in uh, Russia or Norway. Norway. Norway, yeah. Yeah, Radar was built Corpus Christi. Yeah, radar was built uh, by Raytheon and installed it in Corpus Christi. Uh, it has some propulsion uh, on one end of the pontoons. Uh, very sensitive cargo. There's a big radar thing that spins around inside this dome, which is made out of Kevlar fabric and it's kept inflated with air pressure. So the radar spins around inside there and watches for uh, missile launches in uh, North Korea. So it's based in Adak, Alaska, and it kind of roams around the North Pacific and is part of the missile defense shield in the Pacific that keeps an eye on missile launches uh, in various places. Uh, the, uh, the Admiral that was ahead of this program sat with myself and, uh, and my CEO at dinner one night just before we loaded this thing. And, uh, we were quite concerned because they were operating or keeping this thing warm during the entire voyage. And we went from Corpus Christi around South America through the Strait of Magellan and to uh, Honolulu. And this is uh, arriving at, at Pearl Harbor. But we were concerned about the radar being on because it's really powerful. I think it's like the most powerful single radar system ever built. And my CEO said, well, is there a danger to our crew with this thing operating? And he said, right. Look, he said, if a duck flies by, it's going to land on your deck fully cooked. <laughs> no, nothing to worry about. <laughs> no, with that, off we went. And they had the 50 caliber machine guns up here on each side. They would live fire every single day, just in case there was a terrorist somewhere near Patagonia or something. It was strange, but that's the way they did it. This is a 
uh, an aircraft carrier that was built for the Australian Navy in Spain at Navancha. In Spain, we, we took two of these uh, from Spain to Australia on the uh, Blue Marlin. Uh, here you see the, the vessel submerged. And so they built the hull in Spain, and the, uh, the bridge and everything else was installed in uh, Australia. Uh, this is a Russian nuclear submarine. Uh, we've moved uh, seven of these over the last 10 years or 12 years or so uh, for dismantling. Uh, the Russians have 47 of these that are old and falling apart. Uh, they tried to move one by themselves and it wasn't very successful. Uh, they had some problems and so they came to us and said, would you move them because we can gently pick them up out of the water, take them where they need to go and gently put them back in the water. Uh, and it was quite a project, and we've, we've got an entire nuclear protocol that we had to develop to deal with the radiation uh, effects. Uh, they leak all kinds of stuff. They're, they're nasty boats. Uh, but, yeah, and the only ship that they will allow us to move them on is this particular vessel called the Troncho. This vessel was originally built for the Russians. Uh, in Finland, and uh, because it was built for them, they said that's the only vessel we'll put our submarines on. Okay, fine. Uh, we've done a lot of work with the U.S. Navy to help them uh, develop uh, uh, an MLP, uh, a mobile landing platform ship. They've built three of them. Four. Well, they've built three, but the three. Three, only one of them's truly going to be like that. The second, oh, yeah. third, the second, third one got heavily modified. That's right. They needed some help coming up with the criteria for how do we make a converted heavy lift ship of our own that they used to uh, move uh, la uh, landing craft and hovercraft uh, to various uh, theaters around the world. So we helped them. We did some uh, testing in the Gulf of Mexico, off Norfolk, off San Diego, four different uh, programs where we uh, basically uh, helped them figure out how to get cargo from this big, uh, what they call LMSR uh, Navy cargo ship down a ramp onto our deck, load, load you know trucks and tanks onto these hovercraft, and then have the hovercraft take those uh, items to the beach. And that was uh, uh, a lot of fun working with them on those programs. They were they were very successful, and those ships have uh, been built. Here's an example. I, in fact, I took this picture from the hell deck of that ship as the. LCAP was landing on the aft end of our vessel. So in this case, we were able to ballast the aft end of our ship just down into the water to create kind of an artificial beach for the LCAP to land on. And we put these barriers in place here to keep the LCAP from going where it shouldn't go. Uh, back to the Vanguard again, our newest, biggest ship. Uh, Show some more pictures of that. We're, we're really proud of this ship because it's, it's been kind of a build it and they will come theory. Uh, and it's, it's been, we've kept it quite busy. Uh, there's a picture here of the Costa Concordia sitting on the main road. Okay, remember the cruise ship that fell over in Italy? <laughs> and Titan Salvage did an amazing job of building sponsors on that ship and getting it upright and, and getting it floating again. And we actually have a contract with Carnival Cruise Lines to take the Costa Concordia, once it was upright and floating, to a scrapyard in Turkey. That was the plan. And we negotiated quite a contract with them to do this, but at the 11th hour, uh, literally three months before we were supposed to be there to load it, the Italian government stepped in and said, no, 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 that's not going to work. We want this to be a jobs program in Italy. So they towed it across uh, to Genoa, where the ship is now and they're going to take I don't know how many years to slowly dismantle the ship there. They have no infrastructure there to do this kind of work but that was besides the point for the government there. Uh, but they paid us a 20.5 million dollar termination fee and we said thank you very much and we'll be on hold. So. Here's a good picture of the Vanguard with the deck submerged. So you can really see the space here in the bridge. And these yellow uh, posts are called guide posts. And those are used to position the cargo on the ship. So that when the deck is submerged, the top of these guide posts are sticking up out of the water. And you have some references to where the cargo should go. 
So typically we'll paint a line on the cargo and you match up the line with the, uh, the guidepost. Mm -hmm. And they use the old lights and some other methods to get the cargo in the proper place. Because you want it to land on our deck where it matches up with the cribbing pattern underneath in a very precise way. Silly question. In the uh, elevator on the, to get up to the bridge, you have to wear scuba deck gear to get out of it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it might be a good idea sometimes. You, you don't do it when it's submerged. Yeah, yeah. There's times when you use the elevator, times when you don't. <laughs> So here you see a typical cribbing pattern. So this is the wood that's been put on the deck that is basically there to match up with the bulkheads and web frames of the bottom of the cargo that we're going to load. So the idea there is to distribute those forces as evenly as possible throughout the cargo and throughout our deck. Okay, I to presume avoid. that that is bolted down somehow so it doesn't yes. float. Does it? Yes, <laughs> good assumption. Yes. Yeah, the, this, this wood is typically 300 millimeter square uh, timbers, uh, softwood timbers, and they're held down to the deck with metal straps that are tacked over to the deck. It's a small forest. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a small forest. Yeah, it's a small forest. In fact, for, for Thunder Horse, we had to find some European oak. French oak. French oak. French oak. They have a special cut, shipped to Korea, put on the deck of the ship, brought to the United States. Of course, uh, the agricultural department here will not allow it into the U.S. after it's been exposed to the, the sea like that. So I can't remember, we have to take it somewhere and have it burned. But it was about a half a million dollars worth of oak by the time we finished. Why did you have to have that particular oak? Because the engineers do a lot of work to, to, to find out, uh, get, find a wood that has the right friction coefficient so that the cargo bites into the wood to keep it from moving, but not so much that it crushes the wood. So there's sort of a fine line there. Oh. All these pictures look very like sterile. I don't see workers out there. And I'm trying to look at jobs, careers for people who are working on these things. Uh -huh. Is everything done from a boat with everybody inside just hitting levers? Or do you actually have people out here, you know, manhandling things? There's actually people out there. And sometimes they're so small you don't see them. You know, like there's probably somebody right up there. And over here, uh, I'm thinking but, about the guys. But it's a good point. I mean, we do have. You, know, you, you see the guys out there in Alaska on the fishing boats with the sand, and they're right on the deck with the water sloshing over them. I'm expecting to see somebody here with the water sloshing. Over them. I don't see it. <laughs> no, it's you know, it's a pretty slow, controlled process, you know, and, uh, and we have outside contractors. When you're loading 56,000 tons. You know, a guy with a rope is not going to do very much. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. He's going to be one in a wing somewhere up on the top of that tower. He wants to be out of the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So everybody's kind You of mentioned earlier, and, and it's pretty obvious that the towers actually are an independent structure and they are movable, like you said. Yeah. How are they attached and how are they moved? Uh, typically, they're sort of bolted down and, and bolted welded combination. <laughs> I mean, I say to movable, it's not easy to move one of these things. I mean, this is, this is a 15-story building you're moving here. It takes big cranes, big short cranes, a lot of work. What was the set up for, like, with wheel carriages to where they can actually move? On some of our older vessels, the Mighty Servants, there were tracks installed on the deck, the wheels that they could install and, and literally roll them up. I mean, you know, you have a, maybe a forklift or two pushing up the deck or something. But, but these on this particular ship are not easy to move, but it can be done. Do they ever move them with the deck submerged? No. Okay. No. I mean, you know, use buoyancies and drop the ship down and then let it flow over. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Good thought, but, but, but no. They probably tip over. Yeah. 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 They do it out of fabrication or it has big cranes. So. <laughs> Uh, this is a cargo we did uh, last year, uh, earlier this year, excuse me. Uh, this is an FPSO, which is a floating production storage and offloading vessel that went, this is the Callum Canal in Rotterdam uh, that was taken to Singapore. And this is a pretty massive ship on top of a massive ship. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see the screws of the FPSO here. And it just barely fit between those cases. It was a very slow and deliberate floating process. It had to be done in very calm water, very calm 
uh, wind conditions. Uh, I mean, the, the, the windage, wind area there is big, and you don't want your thing moving around, so that'd be a really, really nice day. Do they, uh, how long does it take to load one on? A period of 24 hours, 48, or? Uh, typical operation is when we come in with the ship on day one, Overnight, we pre-ballast the ship, make it down to where the deck is not quite underwater, but just above the water. And then early, early in the morning, we submerge the deck the rest of the way, as far as we need to go to receive the cargo. That day, the cargo comes alongside, it's, it's loaded, we lift it up out of the water that same day, so that's day two. And then maybe day three, four, five, six, we stay there while everything gets sea fastened and bolted down it's typically a five, six day process. Okay. The Goliath FPSO was the largest round uh, floating production system that was ever built. This one was taken from uh, Hyundai in South Korea to uh, Stein uh, fields in Norway. And it's, it was pretty heavy. It was 50 some thousand tons. Uh, this is two uh, semi-submersible drilling rigs that were loaded on the Vanguard in uh, Brazil and taken to uh, Singapore. Uh, they just wanted to relocate those rigs somewhere else and this was the most effective way. But this is the first time two rigs of that type had ever been loaded on one ship. And all of these pictures lately, by the way, of the last four years are all taken by drones. We used to hire airplanes and helicopters and all that stuff, but now it's just some guy with a you know, joystick and flying on thing around. I get great pictures. And it costs way, way less now. So. Excuse me. With, with the reduction of the ice up around the North Pole, have you had occasion to uh, take a northern route? Say Not yet. Korea to, to Not yet. We, we've looked into it very carefully, and some of the oil companies are really looking hard into doing that, uh, you know, maybe with icebreaker uh, assistance. Uh, but we haven't attempted it yet. And these ships aren't ice class, so we have no ice class. I can remember years ago, the definition, the difference between a ship and a boat is that a boat can be taken on board a ship. That's a really big boat there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, we don't like boat. We like ship. Yeah. Or some people really insult us and call them barges. <laughs> so. But so there's what the cost of Concordia would have looked like had we loaded it. And we actually had to do several million dollars worth of modifications to the Vanguard to get ready uh, for. Uh, the cost of Concordia, one of the reasons we had that high termination fees. We had spent a lot of engineering time and money to modify the ship for that one particular cargo. Uh, we had to uh, increase the draft a little bit, had to change the things. Uh, it would have been 105,000 tons when we loaded. So, but of course we didn't do it. And our engineers were really, really quite worried that once we got it on decks, things would just start to fall apart, crumble, and we have a big mess on our hands. So all in all, we were pretty glad they, they canceled it. And this is uh, one of my latest <coughs> projects I'm working on. This is the USS Enterprise uh, aircraft carrier, which was the first nuclear carrier built in 1962, I believe, or 61. Um, and it's being decommissioned uh, at Newport News in Norfolk now. It's been there a year or so, a year and a half, something like that. Uh, and they've got a couple of scenarios that we're working with them on. One was to take the entire carrier like it is. Of course, it's stripped of all the, you know, cables and wires and uh, what have you. Uh, and take it from Norfolk to Seattle around uh, Magellan because the reactor that's inside has to go to Bremerton, uh, Washington to be disposed of. That's where all reactors go to die. I guess they go in the desert somewhere and they bury them or something. They take them to Hanford, Washington and bury them around. Hanford, yeah, they bury them. Like the Columbia River. Yeah. Some of these photos are fabulous photos. Are this your own drone system or do you subcontract it out 
take the drone photos? We subcontract it. Yeah, we don't we don't own them. Yeah. So you know, this is our our engineering department's graphic representation of what the enterprise would look like. So this is a great example of why we built this ship with no bow. Is in this case the enterprise would overhang the bow by about uh, 22 meters and overhang the stern by about 25 meters. <coughs> Uh, so this is the only vessel that could conceivably do this. Otherwise, they would wet tow it with tugs, which would take much, much, much longer, uh, a lot more exposure to problems, uh, fuel stops and what have you, and particularly with a nuclear carrier, they're really averse to making fuel stops. So they don't want to go into any foreign port with that ship. So. What are we going to do with it after the earth, after the... Uh completely deactivate or remove the reactor? Well, there's, there's two scenarios. One is we take it all the way to Seattle, they take the reactor out, and then they either take it back to Brownsville, Texas to scrap it, or they make it into a museum someplace. That's one. Number two, which I think is the more realistic scenario, is the carrier will get wet towed to Brownsville, Texas. They're gonna go dig a big sinkhole. It's the first you've heard of this. Right, dig a big sinkhole in the channel at Brownsville, and then we come in with the Vanguard. They will have removed at that point the flight deck and the bridge down to the main deck. We'll load the Enterprise on our deck and just sit there for three days while they cut it into thirds. So they cut the bow off, they cut the stern off, and there's three pieces. We submerge back down, float those three pieces off. And then the Vanguard <coughs> goes away, they scrap the stern, they scrap the bow, and then we come back with another ship, one of our smaller vessels, and load the center section and take it through the expanded Panama Canal to Seattle and deliver the reactor in that way. So I think that's the more realistic scenario that's going to play out. Uh, so you run into Jones Act problems or that? What does the Navy, uh, well, <coughs> it, Navy is, uh, happy about it, it's the Navy, and, and, and that's a good question about the Jones Act. Uh, when, when Newport News says to us, this is what we'd like to do, we say, fine, <coughs> you get us a waiver, and we'll be happy to do it. So. so you mentioned the Panama Canal, which I was saying, oh, of course, you're not doing the Panama Canal because all the overhang, you wouldn't be able to navigate the, the canal. But I'm thinking, if you're thinking outside the box, and you're someone like my daughter, who's the next generation looking for careers, You've developed the technology to submerse. Maybe there's a business or a career in developing the technology to raise higher so that what your overage over the deck could span over the decks of the Panama Canal and you could go through there. I don't know. And that's actually, yeah. the aircraft carriers have done that for, for years through the old canal. The old carriers went through with the, the flight decks extending over the side of the canal locks. Uh, yeah. but this carriage is too big to go through the old lock. Yes. So the beam of the carriage itself is too big. Too it was big. the first super too wide. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and, you know, if they do this, and I, they, I'm, the Navy's telling me they've got nine additional nuclear carriers that will be scrapped over the course of the next 20 some years. And so this would sort of set the template for how they would be disposed of uh, in Brownsville. So. Do, you, do you think this contract will take longer than the one with the San Francisco? Uh, <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably, yeah. Well, anytime yeah. you're dealing with a Navy and you put nuclear in it, oh uh, there's, there's more red tape than, uh, yeah. they're still making the red tape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. Very nice. So, yeah, it'll be a it has six or eight, eight, I think it's eight, I think, eight. Yeah. eight so there you go, I think, uh, that's, the ship up there. <clears throat> that's it, so with that, uh, you know any questions? Uh, yes, uh, the question was did we move the USS Cole? And uh, I think Greg was involved in that one. Uh, he was a Marine Warrior Surveyor on the Cole, but we, the, the Blue Marlin did move the, the, the Cole before we bought it. Um, and before it was enlarged, uh, brought it to the United States. And then, uh, actually, I, I had the good fortune of, uh, last week of, of meeting the, the guy that was the captain of the coal. At the time, it was hit. 
uh, Commander Leifel. He's a great guy. He is a great guy. Great guy, and tells the whole story in, in a way that's just fascinating. Uh, he has a book about it that I would highly recommend. A really good book. And I got very lucky in that when the coal was put back together, uh, we have a model builder in the Netherlands, and we see all these amazing great models here. We have a guy that builds little tiny models and puts them in a plastic box, right? So I asked him if he would do a model of the coal sitting on the blue arm, and he did, and he shipped it to me, and I had it on my desk. You know, this is, shouldn't be on my desk, it should be on somebody else's desk in Washington. So I called uh, my friends at the Military Seaway Command and said, I have this little model, would love to see it go to the proper place. And I said, fine, we'll call you back. And like an hour later, the commander, who was then the commander, Commander Scott Rady, called me from the bridge of the call and he said, can you be here tomorrow? Because we're shipping out the next day. And so I got the first flight out the next morning and went up there and presented them with this little model. And he took me on a tour of the ship, which was just incredible, just incredible. I mean, the, I don't know if you've seen it, Greg, but it's yeah. I went up for the 10th anniversary. Beautiful, where they did it. So anyway, yes, yeah, sweet. And does anybody have further questions that no. they'd like to ask? No. Okay, okay, well, thank you. Thank you, thank you Rob, very much for coming out. If you'd like some more reading material, please feel free to take that. And thank you all for coming out tonight. We'll see you at our next lecture.